the federal government tends to treat agriculture as a business sector and a commodity, not as a fundamental health need. So I think we ought to start looking at our policies and helping write policy and pass legislation that supports farmers stewarding the land well, growing real food, and getting that food to their communities. Welcome to the Future in Sound podcast. I'm your host, Jen Wilson. This is a podcast where we talk about prioritizing people, planet, and profit. In each episode, we speak with world-leading experts who help us see the future we want and our role in it. This is episode 12, Regenerative Agriculture. Quick story. When I was a graduate student, I decided to study the corporate response to the Haiti earthquake. Corporate interest and disaster response was increasing, and I interviewed major corporate donors and nonprofit recipients of donations. One theme from my research was a bit perplexing. The common saying goes, what gets measured gets managed. But what if important solutions are hard to measure? For example, if you've had a landslide during an earthquake, it may be easier to measure how many schools you've helped to rebuild. But what if planting trees on the bank just beside those schools would reduce the likelihood of future landslides and the need for restoring infrastructure? How would you measure the impact of securing a landslide-prone slope if another disaster didn't strike in the next 100 years? Now, obviously, these examples are very difficult and involve human lives. And it comes up again and again in our work just because it's difficult to measure a particular intervention doesn't mean it isn't important. My guest on the show today helps us think about the challenge of considering intangible benefits in another area, the realm of food systems. Kathleen Finley has been a leader in regenerative agriculture for most of her career. She's also been instrumental in organizing women who work for environmental progress. Since arriving at Glenwood in 2012, she's refined the organization's mission and become a national figure in the United States in the world of progressive agricultural nonprofits. Under her leadership, Glen One has become a premier learning hub for food and farming professionals. Previously, Kathleen was a director of Harvard Center for Health and Global Environment, where she developed and shaped programs to educate communities about the correlation between human health and the global environment. She also created a farm-friendly food policy for dining services and produced a comprehensive online guide to nutritional, seasonal eating, and cooking in the Northeast of the United States. Kathleen, I'm delighted to have you on the Future and Sound podcast. Welcome. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Kathleen, I thought we could start with a bit about your journey. So when we think about, you know, different career trajectories where it's very clear, very linear, and where we where we go from one degree to the next step, you know, say you're going for a medical career, that's one thing. But when I look at your journey, Kathleen, you've been in academia, you've worked in the nonprofit sector as an author, a producer of two award-winning documentaries. I'm really curious, what inspired you to take this journey? Yeah, it's interesting. It's, you know, some of us, I think, have a really clear and succinct vision of how we want to contribute to the world. And that's that's never been my experience. I, I'm curious by nature and get um, excited by looking at many different things from very different disciplines and perspectives. So that's really um, that that kind of, I don't know, you can call it ADD of the mind, whatever it is, that desire to, to kind of know a little about a lot of things has has led me to a pretty diverse path. Um, But 
all at the center of my work and my passion is a is a sense of wonder about the natural world and a desire to um, to honor the nature and to protect it. So when I was young and I grew up visiting the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas and really just spent a lot of time outside discovering plants and animals and trees and adventure that really led me to thinking about how we're connected to nature and that connection between humans and nature is really at the core of everything I've done, whether it's in food or in ocean conservation or you know, empowering those folks who are also protecting nature. Um, that's, that's where my interest lies. I'm looking forward to digging into those uh, intersections between uh, different fields in the sustainability movement. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to get a bit more detail on is Glenwood. So, you know, an important figure in the world of uh, progressive agriculture. I'm wondering if you could uh, paint a picture for the audience just about the farm and about its mission. Sure. So Glenwood, it's the full name is the Glenwood Center for Regional Food and Farming. And what we are is a nonprofit that works in the Hudson Valley to create a just and healthy and equitable and sustainable food system. We do that here in New York, but we are inspired by and work to inspire other regions throughout the United States and even internationally to be working on creating their own regional food systems. And we think regional is really important because that's the appropriate scale of healthy agriculture. That's a, a decentralized way of looking at agriculture that can really optimize how we steward the land and how we feed our communities. So we are headquartered about uh, an hour north of Manhattan and along the Hudson River, and we have a farm here. It's dusted lightly with snow this morning. So it sounds beautiful. It's totally picturesque because I look out my window when we're, as we're talking and uh, we have a farm, we have a vegetable operation and a pasture based livestock operation and those, the purpose of the farm is to train new entry farmers. So we have an apprenticeship program here, and that's part of our larger farmer training efforts that are throughout the region. So we have a farm business incubator that helps farm businesses within their first five years of operating. So that's really one of the main approaches we have is farmer training. Then we also work a lot on food access. We are essentially paying farmers that produce food to distribute to their local hunger relief organizations. So it's a little disruptive model of how hunger relief organizations typically work. They rely on donations and we're paying farmers to grow that food. So it's also getting way more fresh food into the hunger relief organizations here in the Hudson Valley. So the farmers love it because they're getting paid, they are feeding their communities in need. And obviously the folks in the community are getting the highest quality, freshest food available with dignity. So um, that work is really exciting. And then, we have an approach where we just bring, co we build coalitions by bringing producers together. So we have a coalition of CSA farmers, we have a coalition of grains and staples producers and bakers to try and foster production of grains and staples. We have a livestock production groups. So we're sort of organizers. There are so many different routes to go down, uh, and I'm really curious uh, to get your take on, on several elements. But one of the places that I wanted to start is when we think about one of the first things that you said, that actually, you know, it's healthier to have a more regional food system. For our listeners don't, who don't have as much background in agriculture, Kathleen, do you mind explaining to us what some of the primary benefits from a health perspective are in having a local food system? Yeah, sure. I mean, the direct health benefits you're getting, typically you're getting vegetables if you're eating locally or regionally at their peakest ripeness. So the nutritional value is high. They're not transported long distance. You're getting them the day of or day after harvest typically. So the, the food itself is more nutritious. 
And then if you're eating seasonally, some of the interesting studies coming out of Cornell um, helped me understand that even, I mean, most Americans don't eat enough fruits and vegetables, period. But even if you up the serving of the number of vegetables that you eat in any particular day, if it's the same vegetables, you're not getting nearly the spectrum of nutrients than if you ate a variety of vegetables throughout the year, which is what a regional food diet would consist of because you're eating seasonally. So just the breadth of the variety by eating locally is more nutritious. And then there's some other studies that show um, that CSA is really one of the healthiest ways of getting local food. And what I mean by CSA is it's an acronym that stands for Community Supported Agriculture. And typically for CSA, the customer pays the farm in the off season, and then every week gets a share of the harvest. So that style of food distribution uh, is like one of the healthiest ways one can eat. It's also great for the farms because they get the cash when they need it the most, which is when they're buying seeds and equipment and gearing up for the next season. And the customer shares the risk with the farmer. So if it's a bumper crop that everyone benefits, but if it's a tough year for tomatoes, both the customer and the farmer have to deal with the fact that it's a tough year for the tomatoes. But there's only been a few studies done that are looking at the health outcomes of CSA eating, subscribing, and they're pretty significant. So one study looked at the co-payments for prescriptions that are usually tied to diet-related diseases. And those co-payments are cut in half after just one season. Wow. So we need more studies like that to look at the health outcomes of CSA. But my sense just from having now lived off of CSA for many, many years and um, seeing the benefits of when families start a CSA is that it's really one of the healthiest ways you can eat and you can feel good about supporting your farm and your farmer. And it's typically um, more affordable than going to the farmer's market or it's, it's a little bit more affordable item per item than what you would find at a grocery store even. I wanted to pick up on this point about the price, because of course you talk to the average person on the sidewalk, on, on, on the pavement here in, in, in the UK, and you ask them how they feel about food that's more sustainable or organic, whatever it might be. There might be a perception that it's just always more expensive. So maybe it's a privileged thing to access this higher quality, more local food. What's your take on that? Is, is, is that grounded in fact, or is that actually a notion that's not really true in most cases? Yeah, I mean, it's like a little bit of both. What I'm so excited about right now in our work and sort of where I'm the zeitgeist of food is moving the sort of foodie concept of, you know, these really beautiful food that you might go to a restaurant and do a tasting menu. It's a fancy chef and it costs like 500 bucks before you even like order a drink. But the type of food system that we're building at Glenwood is really about food sovereignty. It's about everyone having access to this beautiful food. And I see more and more how folks are are moving away from that sort of elitist, privileged idea of the kind of food that we're talking about. It's still the same kind of food, fresh fruits and vegetables grown locally, but understanding it with a different lens and that it is it's really our right to have access to that kind of food for everybody. Everybody should have access to that kind of food. So we're, we work on that deliberately, how to make it more accessible and affordable in the programs that I mentioned. But what needs to happen in order for that reality to manifest even more is, is really policy changes at the federal level and at the state level. But the federal government tends to treat agriculture as a business sector and a commodity, not as a fundamental health need. So I think we ought to start looking at our policies and helping write policy and pass legislation that supports farmers, 
stewarding the land well, growing real food and getting that food to their communities. And that's just, we just haven't done that. So some of the food that, the type of food that comes from the farms that I'm describing can be more expensive, although I would push back on it. Like if you joined a CSA, it's pretty affordable. It's hard Mm -hmm. to get to the farm sometimes for some folks, but they're more increasingly there are urban drop-offs in majors and small cities. So you can probably find affordable food now pretty widespread in this country. I push back on this notion that it's uber expensive um, a little bit, but I also think that the brand, the branding of fresh, beautiful food has has got a shift to something that's available to all of us from something that's just really privileged. I want to pick up on this point. You know, one of the things that you're uh, sharing with us is the, the important point about scale. So how do we scale some of these important principles? And I'm wondering, Kathleen, you know, if you were an executive of a larger uh, agricultural organization that was for profit, what would some of the principles be that you would incorporate into the more traditional approach? Uh, seeing, you know, obviously Glenwood is pioneering and avant-garde. What are some of the most important principles that you could pull in? It's a great question. Um, I think that the type of farming that we're, first of all, on scale, you know, I, I think that's such a fundamental American perspective on on business is like, how do we scale it up? How do we make it efficient? And I think what the answer to both of your questions is the same. It's we're working to build a system that is really resilient Mm -hmm. and resiliency sometimes has redundancy. It's not as efficient, but it is long lasting and adaptable, which is what we need in light of the climate crisis and other social factors and other factors. So I think that this idea of the kind of food system that we see, it's not scaling that every business is bigger, it's a matter of replication. Mm -hmm. If there was a Glenwood in every region of this country fostering this type of you know, environmentally forward farming that f- that makes food accessible to their communities, we'd be in great shape. And I would argue that even with some of the lack of efficiency that you get when you scale, the resiliency would be a net positive. And so that that resilient t- style of agriculture is the same what I would offer to, if I were an executive of a larger farm or business, how do you build resiliency into your system? And that's going to be different for every operation and every type of crop and every geographic location, but that's the lens I would start with. And on the practice level, that means doing things like rotational grazing, being really um, conscious of the soil that you're farming and being farming for that soil, be doing practices like no-till and things like that. So all these practices that foster a sense of resilience. That makes a lot of sense. I was just thinking when you were talking about the health benefits, you know, in Germany, for example, you can go to the doctor and get prescribed time at a spa where you eat healthy local food rather than a prescription. Um, so it's a you know, very interesting uh, uh, perspective. One of the things we've been working on for a long time is how to incentivize CSA subscriptions for um, for folks through the either their healthcare like insurance provider or now we're working with employers. So as part of your wellness package at your place of employment, you get a voucher to join a CSA um, and maybe you have a drop off at the office location. So that's like getting to just that. How do we, how do we start thinking about food for what it is, which is like fundamental to human health and helping people get access to it. Sort of what I think about. And on the scale and resilience point, what I find really interesting about your answer is that in a lot of different industries, the critical piece of environmental social governance factors or a framing that counterbalances or even increases profitability is a more long-term horizon. Yeah. 
And I'm wondering, one of the things, obviously, folks in business love key performance indicators and measuring and how, maybe it's hard to get a measure, but how do we think about measuring resilience, measuring long-term benefits of this kind of agricultural model? Yeah, it's a really great question. And we do okay in the short-term measurements of you know, we can look at health outcomes of CSAs, for example, or we can look at soil testing, or we can look at, um, you know, we track everything that we grow for. So you can kind of see how, how measure some proxy of how the land is doing by what you're producing, that it's, a, it's abundance, basically, it's fertility. So lots of short term measurements, but I, I think it's hard to get a number. I think that and again, as a, as a leader in, of a nonprofit and an, in the nonprofit world, I'm constantly being asked to show metrics of the work that we do. And sometimes I can do that, but sometimes they're really intangible mm -hmm. and they're stories and they're mm -hmm. qualitative. I mean, they're, they're, yeah, they're qualitative, not quantitative. So I don't know how to measure. For example, we started working with hard cider makers when apple growers were feeling like they couldn't compete anymore in the big apple right in new york we couldn't the apple growers were um struggling and so we started bringing back cider apples that have, haven't been in production in new york since prohibition and now there was like four or five cider makers in new york now there are hundreds of cider makers and there's you know lots of apple orchards growing cider apples and part of that work is bringing together uh, this group of cider makers and growing that group of cider makers and we can look at the numbers like the finances of the cider industry we can look at acres of apple production and cider apples those are metrics but the creation of this community of cider makers and how they all have each other's back and they help each other and they resource each other and they go to each other, like that is impossible to measure, but I would argue it's the strongest part. It's the strongest impact of that work was the relationships we created, the community we created in a, in a practice. So I think trying to measure something like resiliency long-term, it's, it's, it requires us thinking about impact in a different way mm -hmm. and relies really on storytellers and people who can help interpret progress in a way that's not really measurable. That's tricky. It's tricky. And it's likely, it sounds like it's a combination between quantitative and qualitative, which often is the best snapshot of a picture regardless, I would say. Do you know, one of the things that is really interesting about your perspective, Kathleen, is just so often in this ESG movement, there's quite a bit of, I guess, thinking in silos. And we've been talking about agriculture specifically, but you know, you've know, you co-authored a book on health and sustainability, uh, sustainable healthcare, uh, if that's a more appropriate uh, terminology. And, and I'm just wondering from your perspective, What's lost when we look at, say, sustainability without considering healthcare and some of the co-benefits of having a more broad perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think it's critical that we try to get out of our disciplines. And I think like academia is getting a little bit better, but we are so conditioned culturally to think kind of in a, in a, in a siloed way, we are, we are looking at this. We want to be expert at this. We want to be acknowledged for this. Um, so I do see some progress and what's lost when you do that is just, it's just, it's information. It's stretching your imagination about how to solve problems. It's, or how to address different issues. You know, one of my favorite things to do is to talk about what I'm grappling with, with, animators and artists and people had like no idea what you know cover cropping is <laughs> so like um and because they might come at it like a totally different way and have different pieces of the puzzle so there's a lot lost when you don't seek those things out and these are everything is related to everything everything is related to everything and food is fundamental so food touches everything you can't talk about climate change without talking about food. You can't talk about loss of biodiversity without talking about food. So it's 
that's why I love working in food and agriculture because you can you can kind of get to everything and that's right everything's connected so um, I think the more we can get at all of these issues um, from multiple perspectives and areas of expertise, the better shot we have. That's a form of resilience, in fact. Mm-hmm. Another another silo that's common um, would be diversity and sustainability. And that's something actually you've been leading on. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your thoughts and, and the opportunities in the future around diversity as it pertains to sustainability. Like human diversity? Human. I know you've been a leader in um, engaging women. Mm-hmm. Maybe I could share a little story from my side. You know, I was moderating a panel um, a couple of months ago uh, in Banff, Canada, and it was a panel about net zero. And we'd done a pretty good job throughout the conference uh, on different topics, having a diverse panel. And on this particular panel, you know, it was really tricky. It was really tricky. And in sustainability, I think we have to be honest with ourselves that, you know, we do have diversity challenges. And so that's where my question's coming from. I think there's a really interesting crossover between sustainability and diversity and that it ties to your work. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. And when you tell that story, it was tricky because you ended up with a, with a very similar looking panel for the exactly. hero. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I mean, we've done such a poor job in this sector. So I was um, frustrated at a pretty young age on the lack of of gender diversity in organizations, especially the large conservation organizations where I tended to make friends with other women who were all working for men, who all served on boards that were male-led. And that inspired me to organize women to help each other advance leadership in those sectors. And that's an organization called Pleiades, a membership-based network where we we work to help each other in, in the work we're called to do around these issues of environmental and social justice. And that work has been incredibly profound at um, helping those women advance and I'm really proud of it, but there's still a ton of work to be done across. In fact, the needle hasn't moved that much since I started that organization in the large NGO space that addresses conservation internationally. I'm delighted that I've helped be part of a new international organization called Planet Women that is women-led and resourcing women around the world engaged in conservation efforts. Again, frustrated by the lack of uh, kind of more diverse leadership, this group of women just said, why don't we just start a new organization and it's doing well and I'm really proud of that. But uh, still a lot of conversations to be had about um, racism in the environmental sector and organizations role in becoming anti-racist organizations. We're doing that work as a historically white led, well-resourced organization here at Glenwood. We are deeply engaged in that work. And that's one of the most exciting elements of my of my world today is having those conversations and becoming more inclusive and safe for people of color. And we center that work now in most of our programs. Um, I mean, these are not little issues. This is systemic racism is a deep and ingrained problem, but I'm, uh, I hope that what we're doing here at Glenwood and what some other organizations are doing by acknowledging that and addressing it and talking about it is really um, be helping kind of pave the way for a more equitable future. It's an admirable approach, Kathleen. Yeah, there's still a lot of lack of acknowledgement, like in those conferences, like really can't find, you know, you can't, there's, mm-hmm. so now there's also wonderful resources and we do this at Pleiades you can we're developing a website so you can see members and their areas of expertise so that um, this idea that you know that no woman could talk about net zero is like crazy Mm. I I will say this is the Canadian context and so we were half the panel was um, female but we didn't have anybody that was a visible 
minority and but no the the point still stands you know it, it, it's it might take a little bit more time but diverse uh, representatives of particular points of view are out there so no i think it's a, a really great approach that you guys are taking the climate crisis there's a group that was started by a friend of mine ayana johnson um who published the anthology All We Can Save, which is women writing about the climate crisis. And her work now, it involves helping folks find expertise from a diverse range of women. So that's another resource for folks that are listening, but it's growing, lots of work to do. Absolutely. I wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk about a theme that is being woven through this series of the podcast. And that's the theme of greenwashing. So a major trend, uh, I think, this year, my prediction is that uh, there's been a lot of talk about environmental social governance, um, a lot of interest. I was just at COP26 and lots of CEOs were there. And I predict that there's going to be a massive backlash against greenwashing. And I'm interested in your perspective, Kathleen, just starting at a very high level, how do you see or define greenwashing in the agricultural space? Mm. I mean, in the agricultural space, it's on a few different levels. There's a lot of confusion about food for people. And I feel like some large corporations can take advantage of that. Like all natural. What does all natural mean when it comes to food? Like, what does it mean? There's no definition for it. You see it all the time. It's just like, of course it's on. It might have been sprayed with a zillion pesticides, but it's broccoli. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> I, you know, it doesn't mean anything. So there's that that happens like all over the industry. And then it's also heroizing uh, the the farm, the family farm, and like putting a farmer's image on every piece of advertising for a large scale agribusiness. So you get this idea that you're buying, what the product you're buying is like from a family farm, which is just complete bullshit. I mean, it's like, if it's, unless it's an, actually a family farm, but um, of course there are farmers at the, in part of that business, but it's not, it's not portrayed um, with reality. We're certainly not putting a concentrated animal feeding operation on a label, which is probably where that's the kind of system that stuff comes from. So there's so just tons of examples of greenwashing on an individual corporate level. And then there's been some great investigative journalism articles that look at menus and that claim to be from local farms and call them out on that. And I see that all the time, like, you know, farm to table, even like what is farm to table farm, every most food comes from a farm. It's just like which farm to the table. <laughs> so um, but it'll have a farm to table menu and say it uses local food, but it has, um, you know, tomatoes in February that is just like a blaring that <laughs> people look over that. So that's a type of greenwashing. So I think it's very present in the agricultural sector. And I think, you know, we have to kind of keep calling out players that are using our, our authentic desire to, to make the right choices, um, but hiding the reality of, of those choices. And then like any, you know, like every organization in terms of how we manage our portfolio and how others are, managing investments, that's the other part where I kind of live ESG and, you know, try to measure how we're participating in, you know, the economy in general. Mm -hmm. That's also really tricky. And I see more and more, you know, wealth advisors claiming ESG and it, it's hard to ground truth how mm -hmm. much is, is sort of talk there. But I think mm -hmm. there's tools that are becoming more sophisticated to help folks make those decisions. And when you're walking into a grocery store, uh, maybe with someone who's not a food expert and they're looking and they're looking at the, you know, broccoli. So this is okay. So they finished their CSA 
you know, for the week or for the month or whatever their cadence is, they're going into the grocery store and they're holding up the organic broccoli versus the non-organic. You know, if we think about greenwashing in that context, like if we're walking through a grocery store, what are some of the things to look out for to make sure that we're actually investing our dollars or pounds or euros behind the principles that we care about rather than the marketing? Yeah. I mean, it's tough. I don't really go into grocery stores often. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> Wrong person to ask. Wrong person to no, ask. I mean, it, it's, it's, so I would advocate like get out of the grocery store, but it, it, I mean, I, um, that's a little, maybe a little extreme, but um, if your choice is organic versus non-organic, absolutely. Organic is going to be better for the planet in some way, you know, in, in a real way. There's a lot of large scale organic, they're big corporations, they're monocropping. So my sort of advice to folks is don't eat junk, eat real food, right? That's a kind of basic. If it has a, if it's in a package, like try to avoid that part. And then when it comes to fresh food, really try to find local food. I would buy local food that's not certified organic every day of the week. Probably if it's really local, it's coming from a farm that is stewarding the land with organic practices and you're supporting your local farmer. So that to me is my, my number one priority. And then if, it, if, it, if that's not an option and I'm buying into sort of more conventional food system, I would opt for the organic for sure. Got it. That's good to know. That's absolutely good to know. Uh, and, and, I guess coming back to you and your role at Glenwood, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about, Kathleen, it's really tricky, is this notion of trade-offs. There's never going to be any type of food with zero impact, and one could argue, right? And so how do you think about when you're leading an organization that's really focused on impact, how do you think about, in your decision-making, trade-offs between different benefits or costs to the environment or people? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I wish I had a very succinct answer for you. I think that's the practice of leadership and it's sort of like every day. And depending on the scale of those decisions and the trade-offs that are involved, I typically get a lot of input and a lot of data. Those diverse perspectives are really helpful. And what we're trying to do is optimize health writ large. So I would say like social health is included in that. Like how do people feel in these communities? So optimizing that and minimizing harm, you know, it's sort of like first do no harm. Mm -hmm. Agriculture is an extractive thing. So in terms of longevity, our farmers make decisions every day. What is where is that balance? What do we have to sacrifice and give up in order to achieve X? So they're micromanaging that all the time. And then as a leader of an organization, I'm trying to look at the opportunities and, and what's there to serve our constituents, which are really farmers and food professionals in the Hudson Valley, and what's going to help them the most so that they can get um, that so then that fosters fresh, healthy food on the plates of as many people in our communities as we can. I like the idea of um, focusing on doing no harm first. I think that's often a lens that uh, can be missed. This is my last question for you, Kathleen. If we zoom to the future, it's 2030, and the movement toward local food supplies has you know, moved in the direction uh, that you envision. How does shopping for food or thinking about food look different? You know, what could that future be? Yeah, yeah, I love this question. Um, so I think that what we would see, I'm gonna focus on the Hudson Valley because that's where we work, but we would see working landscapes throughout the valley that are being stewarded with care. Those stewards are a diverse set of farmers with, you know, not just white farmers, BIPOC farmers that are making a living by providing fresh food for their communities. We have a 
um, a national CSA subscription program that subsidizes CSA farmers and minimizes the cost for folks to join a CSA so that every American can join a CSA affordably and is eating there in their local food shed. And we are reaping the benefits of the health outcomes of that, of people getting fed, first of all, but getting fed with food that is really, really nourishing. And that's affordable to folks. And my sense of this place is that people also have a sense of pride about the food in their region. And that is part of how they think of where they live is what what foodscape is fostered there. Um, so that's that's a vision. <laughs> Just thinking about your vision, I'm all of a sudden very hungry. <laughs> and craving a walk, I don't know, in a dress. Right, right, exactly, yeah. That's such a, a beautiful vision. And uh, it's so refreshing to hear your perspective on, on how uh, you're doing your part to make that vision happen. Thank you so much, what a fun conversation. Thank you. Thank you to Kat for joining us. You can learn more about her work by checking out the links in the episode description or by visiting re.co.com slash the future and sound. The Future and Sound podcast is written and hosted by Jen Wilson and produced by Chris Attaway. This podcast is brought to you by Rico, an ESG software as a service company helping clients achieve resilient, competitive advantage in the long term. If you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to tell a friend about it. And if you have a moment to rate us in your podcast app, it'd be much appreciated. Until next time, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.